All right, so I want to welcome you. Go ahead and start the clock, but here we go. And I want to welcome you, and I just want to, I want to describe for us something that is just sort of, it's not the whole of our lives, but it's very much a part of our lives. There's this part of our lives that is just stressful, right? And it's stressful from a lot of different standpoints. Here, here could be one. This is that tremendously tragic thing. There, there's, in the world, there's this sort of regular occurrence of something that is just painful. This is the one where this French pilot, or this German pilot, wanted to kill himself and decided to take 149 other people with him. I mean, how heart gut-wrenching that is. That's just horrible, isn't it? I mean, and there's just this thing that happens on a fairly regular basis, right? We get a little reprieve, and then another thing happens, and then a reprieve, and then another thing. And then there are these sort of ongoing things that go on, like ISIS, and just... I mean, this is years in the making now, and it's just unbelievable if you let yourself think about it. It can just be overwhelming, the th kinds of things that are going on. We can go further than that. We can go to, if you really look at geopolitical things and so on, this thing that's going on with Iran right now, I, you can't even begin to project accurately what it means that Iran is getting the amount of power and so on that they're getting in that region in the world. I mean, this is... I realize that a lot of people here don't actually follow these events much and everything else, but for those who do and everything else, this is, uh, this is biblical proportion stuff that is taking place right now in the Middle East. It's, 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 it's unbelievable, but you know, we don't have to go overseas to find things of stress, do we? I mean, you know, there's no stress here, is there? Right? You know, in your workplace, there's never been a bad boss at Microsoft or any other company, has there? They just made your life miserable. There's never been workmates that have just made you want to quit. Right? There's never been anything about a work situation, a deadline maybe, or a ship date, or something else that, that you know, caused you to have to work 24-7, you know, in order to get that thing done and caused all kinds of stress in your life. That's never happened to anybody, right? You know? And then when you get home, oh, that's always just perfectly non-stressful, isn't it? Right? I mean, there's never any stress at home, is there? You know what I mean? Whether you're married or not. You know, roommates and all kinds of stuff that'll take place. And, and I could keep going and going on this, but I just have to say, I think the thing that I'm trying to get to is summed up almost perfectly in this particular illustration. <laughs> and I just, I want to draw your attention to a little something here. Do you see the kid on the right-hand side that's got his head in the microwave? <laughs> Is that awesome or what? You know, come on, that's just awesome. And you see the mom with the hair that's sticking straight out like she stuck her finger in a socket. But look, she's pregnant again. <laughs> so I just have to say, I, I, think that, I think that that kind of almost sums up perfectly life, right? I mean, there's just so much stuff from life, from the over to the to the right, close to home, to everything. There's just these things that threaten to overwhelm us, aren't there? And then, to top it off, you got this pastor who actually loves you and is trying to help you, and what he does is, is that he tells you that the Holy Spirit wants to come upon you and do whatever God wants to do through you, whenever he wants to do it, wherever he wants to do it, however he wants to do it, and with whomever he wants to do it, right? So I've just added one more major layer of stress in your life. You know, what the heck does this mean now? You know, it was okay when I could just sort of follow my agenda and try and make things work out, but now all of a sudden I'm supposed to watch for every need that might happen and I'm supposed to be on the lookout and all this kind of stuff. And, and it, it, I was on the phone with somebody and we were talking just about, you know, life and how it's going right now and all this kind of stuff. And, and it just really became clear as we were talking that I really believe that Satan's number one strategy, and by the way, this is not just modern. It feels modern because we suffer the indignities of everyday life, right? The pressures and stresses. But the fact is, is this has been true throughout history, that the number one thing that Satan uses to get you to not do the things that God wants you to do is busyness. Stresses, strains, responsibilities, duties, things that burden and weigh you down, right? Things that seem as if they're more important even then some of the things that God is telling you to do because there's an urgency. Taking the kid's head out of the microwave seems immediate to us. Right? Okay? So you catch the drift. There's this thing that goes on in life. And, and I want to tell you, and this is where we're going today, 
I want to tell you that I think that there's this funny thing about the economy of God. We see it in tithing when we say, if you want to have your provision met, try giving God 10%. Because God himself tells you to try that. And I believe that that principle plays throughout the whole of our lives to where, this isn't a tithe sermon, don't worry. I believe something, and I honestly try and live my life this way. And that is that if I'll seek first the kingdom of God and what it is to be standing right with him, that he will take care of all those stresses and strains, which does not mean, by the way, that they will disappear completely. It does, however, mean to a very real extent, just try it sometime. Keep God first. Do your devotional first on the day. Martin Luther said, on a day in which I have so much more to do than I could possibly get done, I pray four hours instead of two. I think that there's something to this thing of putting God first that actually does lower the, God God will just protect you from a certain amount that's trying to come on you and to steal you away, to take you out of the things of God and into the things of the world and busyness. But that doesn't mean that it's totally gone, right? It doesn't mean that stresses won't still come, but what it does mean is when you're keeping God first, the way that you handle those stressors is completely different, isn't it? You look at things that are happening in the Middle East and you have a very different perspective when you see God is in control, right? When you don't get to hopeless places, but you get to hopeful places because of what God is doing. And some of these things that he's doing that are stressful are to bless you. All of a sudden, we start seeing life very differently when we will simply do what he told us to do. This is words from Jesus. I don't know how much more clear he could make it. Keep God first what it is to be right with him. He'll take care of everything else. He'll add what you need. He'll take care of. There's all kinds of things that will change if we will simply do that. So let me just ask you, do you want to live a life with less stress? Do you want to live a life that even though you have stress, you handle it quite differently? Do you want to live a life that genuinely has peace in it, even in the midst of stuff? Do you want to live a life that has joy in it? Right? Do you want to live a life that has not just peace and and joy, but glory in it? I mean things that make you go, wow, life is so worth living, as opposed to being buried by the things of life that make us think it might not be and cause us to fly a plane into a mountain, right? Do you want that? Because we're going to take a big step towards doing that right now. And I'm going to have Aaron Godfrey, we're going to have Aaron Godfrey pray. And what a great choice that was, because I really think that Aaron is somebody who, I'm not saying he's always perfect by any means or anything else. He knows that he's not. But the fact of the matter is, is I've seen Aaron in the midst of all kinds of things have a peace and just a godliness and pointing to God all the time that is just remarkable and wonderful. So Aaron, pray for us. Would you lift up another church too? Good morning, Lord. I'm going to come here and just hearing you talk about the stress in our lives and really made me rethink what I want to say for a prayer but Father through this stress in our lives we just ask that we not only hear your word but really receive that we need to do your word and that the stress that Jesus went through was so much more than we will ever understand and it was for us Father and we just we just receive that and want to act upon that and I raise up Santa de Vida from Miglar and Tacoma and Pastor Alberto Tejada in his sermons, Father, and Thank you, just reach out to all the world through through all the churches. In Jesus' name, Father. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Now, I've titled this sermon. I don't normally tell you what the title is because it doesn't matter that much, but I like this particular title. So the title of the sermon is How I Learned to Stop Wearing and Love the Bomb. <laughs> okay. Many of you will remember that from Dr. Strangelove. If you don't, you know, whatever, okay? But the bottom line is, is that I want you to, I just, before we really dig into the meat of where we are in our Luke passage today, I want us to look at something in the, in the macro. I want us to step back and look at something. How long have we been in empowered? Anybody know? I had to look it up. No, it's been two years and a few months. We started in January of 2013. So it's, it's two years and a few months, okay? Now, watch this. 
How long did the disciples spend with Jesus? Three and a half. Three and a half years. That's as best as we can get. We can't get it exactly, but that seems to be the closest we can get is about three and a half years. So now, I've told you before that Luke, we're doing Luke because we're going through Luke and watching how Jesus discipled his disciples because we're assuming that God is discipling us the same way, right? Well, I want to propose something to you that I didn't know until today, until this week when I was working on this. About how long into the ministry was it that God got to Luke chapter 11 where we are? That got to where he went through the college stuff where he was showing them to the stuff where he actually started sending them out. About how long into the disciples' three and a half years was that? It was right at two years. So I just want to propose to you that not only is the Lord showing us how he discipled his disciples, but as we let him lead us, he's actually taking us on the same journey that they went on. Now, let me show you what I'm talking about when I say that. Those first two years that the disciples were with him, and it's very hard to tell exactly how long that was. I've looked a lot, and nobody can get it just right. But the best guesses are that they started, he started sending them out somewhere at around two years. Now, look what he was doing there. He was totally changing their worldview for the first two years. He was, he was making them to understand that this thing about miracles is not the unnatural. It's the ordinary. It's the natural. It's the real. It wasn't a thing that was extraordinary and out there and needed to be sort of, wow, do I really believe in this and stuff. He walked with them so long, showing them the things that he would do and how he would do it, that they really did come to a place to where they started thinking of God as doing miracles as something that was normal. Now let me ask you, if you've been here for two years, you know, that seems like a long time to be in there, but have you gotten to a place to where you sort of think that God doing miracles is in fact the normal way that God does things? That that is how he works? That he does, he really does do them? You see what I'm saying? This wasn't just a little four-week series that we did, and then we moved to our next four-week series, because after all, what can you possibly not learn in four weeks? Everything you should ever have to learn about anything should be able to be taught in four weeks, because that's the modern mindset, right? Four, maybe, just go to six weeks, because it's really important, right? And yet Jesus took with human beings just like you and I, Two years to sort of really get them into a different space. And then he started getting, kicking them out of the nest and started saying, now go out there and experience some things, right? Go out there and try some things. And by the way, when he would kick them out of the nest, what would he do next? He, wouldn't just, he didn't just do this. The disciples did not get sent out, and that was it. Uh, they'd seen everything, and now they'd actually experienced something, and now they were ministers forevermore, and they were ever just perfect, and they were gone, and off to, off to the races, Right? We've all seen people that have done nothing but spend their time in ministry and burn themselves out horribly, haven't we? End up making terrible mistakes and so on. Here's what Jesus did with his disciples. It's like breathing. He exhaled and they went out. And then he inhaled and brought them back in and he would teach them something. But look at what he would teach them when they came back. He would teach them what they couldn't know unless they'd gone out. See it? There would be something that would happen that when they got back, he'd be able to teach them something because they'd gone out. Do you see it? So he's still teaching them. It's still master's level. See, they're not in the doctorate program yet. That's after he dies. Okay? I don't know what's going to happen in, when we're done with this in three and a half years. Okay? And we won't be done in three and a half years. We'll probably be done with the disciple part in three and a half years. And then there's that several chapters on the passion, which are totally fun to play around in for a little while. Right? Okay, maybe that wasn't exactly the right wording on that, but you know, okay. <laughs> okay, do you see it? I think that God is doing this, and what I have to say is, is it puts me at peace, because see, two weeks ago, and two weeks before that, about a month ago, I sent everybody in here out, I believe it was the Lord, and really pushed hard in a couple of weeks and said, go out and do things, go out and do things, go out and do things. And several people went out and did things and have written back things, and you've been hearing some of the testimonies, and they've been awesome. Several people, to their huge credit, said, well, I tried, but nothing happened. That was awesome. That was a perfectly, perfectly reasonable response. Okay? I know that there's also plenty of people in here that, I don't know if you intended to do it or not intended to do it or whatever, but it just didn't really rise to the level of a priority in your life to where it became a big deal to you. I get that which is the reason why we're not going to take four or six weeks on this. 
We're going to take the same amount of time that Jesus did because Jesus took a long time with his disciples too because it took them a long time to understand and to really own what the fullness was. When the Jews were going into the land, God said, I'm not going to give you the land all at once. Why? Because you're not strong enough, you don't understand enough, you don't understand the land and everything else. You're not able to take and hold the land. You don't know enough. And I'm, so instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it to you piece by piece by piece. So that when you take ownership of it, you truly do own it. It's yours. See what I mean? So I just get this huge... You may feel pushed by me. I would hope that you feel pushed a little bit by God. But I want you to know that it's the push of an exhale that is followed by an inhale. As God would then equip you more. And then he would send you out again. And then he would equip you more. And then he would do something else. And then he would equip you more. And then he would do. And that's the journey that we're on. And that journey, as Paul said, was... I'm certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it's finally finished, which is the day that you die or the day that he comes back again, whichever comes first. Right? You see it? Does that, does that give you, does that release you a little bit from the stress of what we're talking about? Here's what it doesn't do. It doesn't give you license to not do it. If, I, if we say go, it doesn't give you license to say, oh, I'll go next time. That just puts you behind, right? That just says you missed whatever you would have learned that he would have then taught you, right? So now you're just, right, you're, okay? But, but at the same time, what it doesn't do is start putting this thing on you in a way that starts to become a religious duty. Duty. There's a pun in duty. Uh, think about it. It's a, it's a responsibility that becomes a duty becomes kind of crappy. There's a weight. You see what I mean? There's a way of doing religion that becomes a not an easy yoke and a light burden, as Jesus said it was. But it becomes something defiled and different than that. Do you see it? That's where we're going. So in that regard, let me show you where we are right now, okay? And then we're going to pick up some other pieces. But right now, let's just look at this story. They continued their travel... And then they've been sent out, they came back, and they did the Good Samaritan story, and then they do this. So they, there's a little time between Good Samaritan story and this one, but this is the next story. Jesus entered a village. A woman by the name of Martha welcomed him and made him feel quiet at home. She's very good at that. She made him feel quiet at home. That's awesome. She had a sister, Mary, who sat before the master, hanging on every word he said. Now, I'm, this is the sermon, and this is the sidebar, okay? So I'm in a sidebar moment right now, Okay? She sat at his feet and hung on every word that he said. I want you to understand that that is the description of a disciple. That's how you describe a disciple. And I want you to understand that in that day and age, that was something that was not available to women. Women did not sit at the feet of the rabbi and hang on their every word. They did not do that. What they did was the kitchen. They provided for the people, the men, who were sitting at the feet and hanging on every word. I bring this up because the next time you hear somebody talking about male and female roles in a way that I would consider to be overly simplistic, that would miss the fullness of the gospel, that would take a word that was spoken by Paul and was intended and is important to, uh, to, to not dismiss. We cannot dismiss those things just out of hand. But I would submit to you that there is a witness of Scripture that goes beyond a simplistic understanding of that verse. And that we need, that we need to understand that God is bringing female disciples to do all kinds of ministry, as would any disciple, okay? So, all right, if you don't think women should preach in church, I would love to talk to you. I will not try and talk you out of whatever your position is. I'll just tell you the one that I have. And the reason why we do it here, because I can tell you right now, the reason why we do it here is not because we ignore Paul when he says, I do not permit a woman to preach. But I have authority is what he says, right? But I'm telling you, we don't just ignore that. 
We take it seriously. And so if you want to know what that is, I'm even thinking at some point in time, because there's enough new people here that I may need to talk about it again, so that people understand how we are genuinely conservative in our, th in our theology, and yet we still arrive at the place where we'll have women speak. Okay? With that said, I'm out of the sidebar. I'm back to the sermon. Okay? All right. So here comes Martha doing what is totally... You have to understand, what Martha's saying is what the culture would consider to be the right thing to say. We look at it with our emancipated eyes and our understanding of what Jesus replied to her and so on, and we think what Martha said was terrible, but the fact of the matter is, is it's not just Martha that would say that, it's the culture that would say this. And what Martha said was, is, now look at, I love the wording on the message, is why I used it. Martha was pulled away, distracted by. See, she could have sat and listened too, but no, there were other things that needed to be done, and so she got caught up in those things. And she had to do in the kitchen. Later, she stepped in and interrupted them, <laughs> right? There's this really precious thing happening, and she interrupts them, and she says, Master, don't you care that my sister has been? See what she's saying? Culturally, she's supposed to be helping me. Don't you care? She's not fulfilling the proper cultural role. Don't you care that my sister has abandoned the kitchen? <laughs> See that to me? Tell her to lend me a hand. Okay, straighten her up. What is she doing sitting there at your feet? Right? And Jesus' response, of course, is the master said, Martha, dear Martha. He doesn't hate Martha. He's not mad at Martha. He's saying, Martha, I understand why you're saying what you're saying, and I love you. Right? But you're fussing far too much and getting yourself worked up over something that accounts and amounts to nothing. Really. In the big scope of things. One thing only is essential, and that's the right wording. That's the word, essential. And Mary has chosen it. It's the main course, and it won't be taken from her. So the thing that we want to do is we want to, this only one thing is essential. What's that thing? It's pretty simple, very straightforward. What's the one thing that's essential? It's the word, but even more, the word from God. <laughs> It's God saying the word, right? That's like essential. That's the biggie. That's better than kitchen and meals and eating and, you know, give me my daily bread. And you know what I mean? This is, this is the something more important here than bread, as Jesus says, right? So this is simple. The thing that's essential is to hang on every word that Jesus says. That's essential. That's why we hang on the word the way that we do. Right? That's why we don't take it as something that we tell it what it says. We take it as Jesus trying to tell us something that's going to inform our life. That's why we handle our scriptures so carefully. Right? So the bottom line is, is that's the thing that's essential. But, but, and we could just say, okay, so that's it. Hang on every word that Jesus says. Study your word. Listen to Jesus. You know, and move on. That would be a great sermon. That would be just fine. And let's go on. But can we stop for just a second and smell this rose a little bit more? Because I want to juxtapose this story with the one that was told right before it. What was the story that comes right before this story? The Good Samaritan. Now I want you to put yourselves in the feet of the people who are the disciples. Here they are. They're walking on a journey. This is just a figurative journey, but I'm on a journey, right? And what happens is, is first I've gone out and I've done all these things. And then I've come back and now I'm with Jesus. And now what happens is, is that I'm walking along, and, and he does this thing with the Good Samaritan story. We were just sent out, and now he's confronted these religious leaders about what the spirit of service is, about what it is to be the neighbor, about what it is to be the one that God is wanting you to be. Now, do you think as a disciple that it would be possible for you to start to think that God's highest goal for you, given what just happened, he sent you out and then told you Good Samaritan, would it be possible for you to think that the most important thing in life was ministry to people in need? Isn't that a reasonable inference from that? It's a reasonable conclusion, right? If you stopped right there, Jesus never did another thing, that was it, he was gone, you would say, he just wants us to go out and do things and help people. Make a difference in their lives. And he certainly does want us to do that. But you would think of that, you could easily get that twisted around in your head to where that was the highest thing that Jesus was trying to teach you. Do you see it? So he lets them live in that moment as they walk to the next village. 
They live thinking about the Good Samaritan story, thinking about going out, thinking about all of these things to where it started to ingrain in them about that there's something very fundamental about caring for people that need help. This is what he's saying, right? And so they're thinking that. But now do you see the next thing that he brings them, this encounter with Mary and Martha, do you see how it's a confrontation to that idea? Because Martha is the one who's doing stuff to help people. Mary's just sitting at his feet. Do you see it? Do you see how in terms of the experience, the learning that's happening in the disciples, do you see how this Mary and Martha thing becomes a confrontation to a misunderstanding of the Good Samaritan story? He's doing a corrective here. He's causing them to understand there's something more important than serving people. See it? There's something more critical. Now, understand, this is a huge impulse, and we're going to take a minute, and, and this, I hope this goes as well as I think it's going to go. Uh, understand, it, it, let's stop before we have the Martha Mary story, and let's build our theology on whatever's happened before that time. And so we come to this theology, in, found in the Bible, by the way. James, foolish man, are you willing to learn that faith without works is useless? Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was active together with his works. And one place I'll say it this way. You show me your faith without your works, I'll show you my faith by my works. Right? And by works, faith was perfected. So the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness and he was called God's friend. And the, the argument James is making is the reason why he was called God's friend, the reason why it was credited to him for righteousness was because he offered Isaac on the altar. That's the argument that James is making. Do you see that? Now I want you to understand something. That's the argument that the Catholic Church makes when they say that it is not by faith alone that a person is saved. The Catholic Church to this day in its doctrine has a fundamental thing which says it's faith and works. And by the way, if you don't get enough works, you don't get to go straight to heaven, you gotta go to this purgatory place. If you do enough works, then you can bypass purgatory and go straight into heaven. Purgatory is not found in the Bible anywhere whatsoever. It is a doctrine of man that tries to reconcile an issue. Then this is it. There it is right there. See what I mean? So works is important, right? Now, if all of a sudden you read the Martha Mary story, and now you have to build your theology, all of a sudden you start coming to there's something more important than works, and you will do what Martin Luther did, which was Martin Luther was the guy that said, look, you've got to understand, I was like Paul. Paul was the guy that was the Pharisee, who did everything that the Pharisees were supposed to do, and it turned out not to work like they said it was going to work. And I was the guy who did everything that the Catholic Church told me to do, and it turned out not to work like they said it was going to work. I, he even flagellated himself. He would, he would beat himself. Okay? I mean, it, it, Luther did everything. And he said, I wasn't finding the things that God was promising me, joy and peace. What I was doing was I was becoming more and more weighted down, more and more heavy, more and more burdened by the duty, pun intended, of religion, the responsibility. See it? And all of a sudden, Martin Luther reads Paul, and he sees this. Now, understand something, by the way. James's argument that he just made was against this argument that Paul's making right here. James was literally responding to Paul's argument about grace and so on. So James was saying what Paul says is not true. So we got a conflict in the Bible. That happens every once in a while. You, you got to read your Bible as a, as a thing where God is showing us all kinds of things. Let me show you. Here's what Paul says. If Abraham's good deeds had made him acceptable to God, didn't James just say it did? He said it made him a friend. That's what James said. If Abraham's good deeds had made him acceptable to God, he would have had something to boast about, but that's not how God does things. That's not what he's doing here in the good news. 
For the scriptures tell us Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. And let me just make it clear, a long time before he ever sacrificed him or was willing to sacrifice his son. When people work, their wages are not a gift, but something they've earned. Let me paraphrase so that you get what he's saying. If your salvation is because of the works that you did, you've earned it. It's not a grace. It's not a gift. It's your wages. If you did enough works to get into heaven, you get into heaven. Right? There's the accounting. Right? That's it. That's what he's saying. It's not a gift. It's a, it's a wage. But people are counted as righteous not because of their work. Rather, because of their faith in God who forgives sinners, which is to paraphrase to say, what he's saying is, is he's saying, you and I couldn't do the simple little things that God asks us to do. We couldn't do it. We needed a Savior to come and to save us. That's the good news. Solo fide. Only faith. Not faith in works. Only faith. This is the Reformation. This argument right here is the Reformation. Right? And this is where Luther comes along and says about James, he doesn't belong in the Bible. Because of what he said. And let me put it this way. He's got a good argument. But let me put it another way. Why would God leave James in there then? If the good news of Jesus Christ is grace, unmerited favor, people who could not do what God asked, and so God came and did it in them and for them by making them new, by dying for what was due them, and then making them new in themselves. If that's what God did, that's good news, <laughs> right? That's me who cannot. God did. That's exceedingly great news. The gospel is, is literally the, the translation for good news. That's good news, See what I mean? Works is sort of more of the same news. See it? So why is James in the Bible then? And why do I believe he needs to be in the Bible? Because if we only had what Paul said, just like a person could pervert the Good Samaritan story into a works place if we didn't have the Martha and Mary, a person that only has what Paul says about grace could become flippant about salvation. Once saved, always saved. I'm having an affair. I'm a horrible drunk. I treat my kids terribly, but I'm saved because I got baptized. Once saved, always saved. You see it? I think that what God is doing in James is he's saying, here's the good theology. It's Paul. Are we clear on that? Paul's the good, the that's the, Protestants. We're Protestants, Protestants. That means protesting. We protested what Rome said about faith and works, and that makes us Protestants, which makes us Protestants, which makes us believe that it's by grace and God's grace alone. And if I asked you, do you get into heaven by your works? I pray that not one person would raise their hand in here. Nobody. Okay? Are we clear? But James need to be in there too because it's a corrective to a misunderstanding that we could get in that to not understand that our faith needs to have something that works out. In fact, Jesus says it this way, all who love me do what I say. We'll do what I say. My Father will love them and we will come and make our home with each of them. Anyone who doesn't love me doesn't obey me. <laughs> Could it be more clear? This is not works, right? This is just listening, obeying, doing. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. And remember, my words are not my own. What I'm telling you is from the Father who sent me. So you could get to James without having James in the Bible. But James becomes a really nice, helpful corrective to a wrong theology because we get it right. Now, now we're going to demonstrate this right now. Okay. A month ago, I told you to go out and do right? And then I said it the second week, and they pushed you for two hard weeks, and I said, send me testimonies, and I sent out two emails to you, and text messages, and all kinds of stuff, and I really pushed hard. I believe it was the Lord pushing, but I really pushed hard to get you to go out into the field, didn't I, right? Right? Now, I'm asking for a little honesty here. Not a little. I'm asking for a lot of honesty here. I'm asking for you to raise your hand if there's anything in you just be honest. We're in family. It's okay. 
I need people to see what actually goes on inside of us rather than some idealistic view of what we are. Is there anybody here that when I pushed you to go out, if you either didn't go out because you didn't remember or, or you tried but not really and then you walked away from something, is there anybody in here that has any feeling whatsoever that if I don't do what's being asked, maybe I'm not really a good Christian, maybe even something about my salvation getting mixed into this somehow? I, I just want to know, for real, raise your hands. There's some hands already going up. Raise your hands. Is there anything like that in anybody? Is there really nobody that would be bold enough to raise their hands on this? Thank you. Is, is there anybody that would raise their hands and say there's something about it? See? And, and I, I just want to say, when you don't do what God's telling you to do, how do you feel? How does it make you feel? Are we supposed to just say, oh, well, that grace is covered by that too? I don't know. The scripture that we just used a second ago is the people that love me are the ones that do what I say. You see it? I really want to argue, and I really want us to admit, I really want us to own something about our human nature, which is that while grace and grace in God is absolutely true and is the exceedingly great news that we celebrate every Sunday and next Sunday in particular, while that grace is, is remarkable and incredible, there is something else going on. And that is that we all do have a tendency to take these things of religion and turn them into a little bit of an obligation and a have to and a duty and a... You see what I mean? There's something that happens in us that makes us do that. And it, it makes us sort of not necessarily all the way where Mary is and not all the way where Martha is but somewhere in between the two, to some degree. Do you see it? Where the thing, did it feel like a duty to anybody to have to go out and do that? Let me just ask that question. How many hands would raise and feel like when I pushed you, it felt like a duty to do that? Go ahead, raise your hands. Okay, see what I mean? Okay. We have to get free of that. We have to get the spirit right. I can tell you right now that when I ask that question, does anybody feel a duty on it? There's some people that don't raise their hands, and so they get the answer right, but for the wrong reason. Because here's what the reason is. I'm not going to do anything, Kurt says. <laughs> I don't know why you come to church here. <laughs> I honestly don't. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of people in here that do that. I'm not saying a ton. But, I mean, it's, there's people that are like, if he asked me to do something, they just automatically, it's like, oh, I'm not doing that. And I'm like, I don't understand. You know what I mean? I, I think most of us try and discern whether it actually is God. If it's me that's asking you, don't do it. Feel free. I don't care. Okay, but if it actually is God that's asking you to do it, then maybe not doing it isn't quite exactly the right place to be. But there's also people that would be sort of enough that they would say, look, I don't, it's not about works. They would take that sort of almost, now watch this, my phrasing is advised here, legalistic view of grace. Right? This sort of lawyerly view of grace. It's, it's not by works. I don't have to worry about doing any works. Right? If it's not by works, it means I don't have to do anything. Is that true? No. But the reason why it's not true is because you have to do something to gain his favor, to get into heaven, or to gain salvation. The reason why it's not true is because there's something that God is trying to do in you through the things that he's asking you to do. That's not to say that it's not about the person that's being helped too. God certainly wants to help people that have need and are beat up at the side of the road, good Samaritan. But do you understand that when you're doing that, God is also doing something in you which is of enormous value to you so that when you come back in the inhale, there's something that he can teach you and grow you. Do you see it? Let me, just, let me just show you how works is not the point in a little deeper and more, more interesting fashion. Okay? The reason why God has us here is because there's all kinds of people that have all kinds of need. And so, and you hear this all the time in Christian circles, we can eradicate the sex trade. We can eradicate that. Right? You should be working on that. 
But to think that you're going to eradicate that from the world, you know, that shouldn't, that shouldn't cause you to not go out and work it if you're not going to totally... Can you get rid of poverty in the world? Can you? The reason why we say no is because we know this story. And the story is, is that Jesus is in Bethany, and while he's eating, a woman comes in with an alabaster jar of expensive perfume made from an essence of nard. She broke open the jar, poured the perfume over his head. Some of those at the table, and I've used this translation because another one goes into how Judas was stealing money, and so he was indignant. And this is the moment where he goes out and betrays him that it'll be in the garden. So we're right towards the end of the betrayal, right? Okay. But the point is, is it wasn't just Judas that was offended at that. There were other people at the table, and they said, why waste such expensive perfume? They asked. It could have been sold for a year's wages and the money given to the poor. So they scolded her harshly. <laughs> what was Jesus' response? You'll always have the poor amongst you. That doesn't mean don't do anything about the poor. If you don't do something about the, if you say, oh, well, now I don't have to do anything about the poor because there's always going to be poor, so what do I care? Well, then you're going to be before the Lord, and the Lord's going to say, hey, there were some poor people. I wanted your help. How'd you do? Well, I didn't think I had to do that because there's always going to be poor people. Right? Come on. He's saying make as big a dent as you can possibly make. But don't misunderstand. The world is a fallen place. It's a corrupted place. And the idea is, is you're going to have the poor, and you can help them whenever you want to. You're supposed to help them. But then he says this thing that is extraordinary. But you will not always have me. That wording, you will not always have me, does that sound similar to the wording that we just read a second ago? Do you see it? You will not always have me. One thing is essential, Mary, hanging on every word that I say. See it? She's got the bigger part, the main course. Do you see what he's saying? saying? You see what he's putting as paramount? The works that we do are penultimate. You know what the word is? Penultimate means the thing that's right next to ultimate. The second best. But the ultimate thing that God is going for is us with him. See? Now we know this, don't we? We know that what God wants to do is to conform us to his image. Those he foreknew, that's you. If you know him, he predestined you to be conformed to the image of his son. That's what he's doing. In this going out and coming back, he is conforming you to the image of his son. And as he does that, there's an even more fundamental thing that's taking place. You're actually being able to become one with him. The more like Jesus you are, the more that you can be one with him, right? This is what he's going for. He's trying to bring us into who he's made us to be in the new birth. He's made us new creatures. His nature, God's seed is in us. He's trying to grow us up into who we really are and not the old thing that we were. And in so doing, it conforms to, this, to the image of his son and it lets us become one with him, doesn't it? It just keeps going. Look, okay, here. Watch. Bob Lee, did you guys just see that? <laughs> did, you, did it go away too quick? Dave Cole ran, his last job before he retired was Coinstar, big, big company. He was the head of large, large divisions in large companies, and he discovered something about large companies that were trying to accomplish something, about how they didn't fulfill their missions. And he became very good at it, and then one day he met this guy, Bob Lee, and Bob Lee showed him, in a technical fashion, what it was that was missing in most of corporate America's work on how to get things done. And what Bob Lee, the way that Bob Lee tells it, and if I got this wrong, Bob, and you're hearing this, I love you, excuse me, but, but Bob is at, a, at another convention, yet another convention, for managers of thousands of people to try and figure out how to make thousands of people get things done. And so they're, it's all on. All of a sudden, Bob said, he said, I got a call, and I had to walk out, and then I need to go to the bathroom. So I think he was standing at the stall when he got this epiphany revelation that changed his life. Just saying, that's the part I would apologize for, Bob. But he all of a sudden he said, you know, everything that I ever learned at any of these conventions is all about how to do things. Do, do, do. How to do them better. And he says the reason why we need more and more conferences about how to do things is because it seems like no matter how well we've structured them to do them right, they, they don't seem to work as well as they ought to work. They're designed beautifully, and yet they don't work. Why do they fail? 
And his answer was, is because the people that are doing the task aren't being the people that they need to be in order to get the task done. Think about this. You can have the greatest strategic plan ever. And if the team is made up of egotists and dysfunctionals and uh, people that won't respect each other and people that will interrupt each other and make life miserable for each other, will that team succeed even though they've got a perfect plan? It won't. You see? And so what Bob said was, is he realized doing is very important. Having good plans, having good structures, the right-hand side here. The inner stuff don't look at too much because it'll just distract you. The doing is what I'm looking at on the right-hand side. You've got to have good plans. But he said just as important as good plans is good people. In fact, let's be, let's be real about this. How many times have you seen people without a good plan, but with a lot of respect for one another and, and valuing of one another? How many times have you seen a team succeed despite a bad plan? Because the people were good. The people were being the right kind of people. You see it? Now let me show you where we actually still do this to this day in this church. There's still a lot of things about Bob that we do, and there's more that we are going to be doing, but the bot I hope. But the bottom line is this is a staff assessment. Okay, so when, you, when we go to staff meeting, at staff meetings we assess five variables. Usually right now we got eight on there, but we keep, try and keep to about five. And what we're doing is, is we're saying, and they, those change all the time. Because what we're doing is we're saying, what things are we doing interpersonally that cause us? I'll move out of your way, Alex. What things are we doing interpersonally that cause us to undermine our success? What things are we doing to each other? So, for example, interrupting was one of the first ones that we put on there way back. That was our number one. And I got to tell you, I, I grew up in a family of five boys that were a total of seven years spread. Interrupting was not rude. Interrupting was conversation. That's how you talked. If you finished a sentence, that was a miracle. Okay? You know? I mean, seriously, interrupting meant nothing to me. Now, because of this thing about being, now when people interrupt people, I can't take it. And I still interrupt people. But it just drives me crazy now. Because that person wasn't able to express their thoughts, and it doesn't matter whether they had a good thought or a bad thought, they're going to be mad. And the, the whole thing is going to go downhill, and it doesn't matter what we're talking about anymore. We've just dysfunctioned any value out of what's happening. You see it? We're not being the people that we need to be. So just look at these. I was in the moment giving full attention to people or tasks at hand. This is in September 14 is my grades, and then my grades in February. I allowed others to complete their thoughts by not interrupting, not giving space for their contribution. That sounds like a good one, right? I was on time and prepared for meetings. Reading done, actions completed. Still have a long ways to go on that. I listened to others giving honest consideration to their ideas. I actually think that that's something that I do. I think people think I don't because I respond so quickly. But I, I, I'm, they're probably right and I'm probably wrong. I'm implementing next steps for my weekly long-range planning. I'm still bad on that. I assume noble intent, responding with respect and grace. I assumed that they were trying to help instead of assuming that they were trying to do something dysfunctional. Those are not bad, are they? And just think how much better it would be in your workplace if the people that you worked with all were working on those things continually. They don't even have to get them perfectly right. They just have to be working on it and getting better at it, right? Wouldn't that make a huge difference? So what we're saying is, is that there's something in this Christian walk that has to do with, I'm with Christ, I'm hanging on his every word. I'm seated at his feet, I'm hanging on his every word. And then that moves me into a place where I can move out now and actually be the expression of him. See, if I don't know who he is, how am I going to properly be? How am I going to be when I'm doing? What am I going to do? Because it may even be the right look on the outside, but it'll be the wrong heart if I don't know the heart of why Jesus is doing this. And what happens is, is that when we get this being and doing, this exhale of going out, and then the inhale of sitting at his feet, and then the exhale of going out, and then the inhale of sitting at his feet. Do you remember what Jesus did, right? He would go out and do ministry, but then what would he do? Look at the Gospels. There would be these long breaks. And he would go into the wilderness and pray. And then there would be these long breaks where he would take time. And there was a time gap where he was letting things assimilate again. Do you see it? 
So I just want to say, see, when we do this right, do leads to increased being as we come back and then the inhale, and then the increased doing, and then increased being, and then increased doing, and it leads to increased being and increased doing. And you see what we're doing is, is we're getting ever more conformed to his image where we can actually become one with him, which is the ultimate thing that we're going for. Two weeks ago, Justine stood up here and gave a 30-minute sermon, which I think is the most important sermon that's been spoken about Empowered since its beginning. If you did not watch it, it's only about 30 minutes long, then there's a discussion after that. I would highly recommend you just go on the website and listen to it. And here's what she said. If you had to sum it up. She said more than just this, but if you had to sum it up, it went something like this. She was talking about the Good Samaritan, and she said, when we look at the Good Samaritan story, we think of it as a story about ministering. It's not a story about ministering, it's a love story. God loves the person who has been hurt, who's been damaged, who's been beaten. God loves that person, and he's trying to find anybody, even a hated Samaritan. He's trying to find anybody that will simply manifest his love for that person. Now, when Justine said that, she took all of the duty out of the responsibility and the have to of ministering, didn't she? Because what she did is she turned it into love. God is just asking us to love people, right? Really love them. Not just say you do, but love them and put it into action, right? Tangibly love them when you can. And all of a sudden, it just made me realize something. When we started this Empowered series, I thought the Empowered series was going to be about God teaching us how to move in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what I thought we were doing. About a year ago, if you'll remember, God so sidetracked us. It was in the spring of last year. And he so sidetracked us on something that I said, I just feel like God has taken this whole series away from me, and he's showing us something about who he is that's causing me to fall in love with him more deeply than I've ever, ever even began to understand him before. His grace and his mercy. I mean, it's, it was seriously the most powerful three or four months of sermons and of experience with God that I've probably ever had in my life. I thought I knew God, and I thought I loved him. And the love that he showed me that he has for me and that he has for us and the, who he is in love, it just blew me away. And it was just week after week, God was just doing this gracious thing. It was the time when I was kissing Hayden's feet and just showing what love looked like. You, you, most of you will remember that if you were here because that's pretty memorable. <laughs> but I thought that we were doing empowered so that we could become more effective in, of instruments of God's in the world. And what God has been showing us and what I think he's trying to say to us right now is, is, is it's not really about ministering to others. Instead, it's about love. He's trying to show us how moving in an empowered state is because of love. 1 Corinthians, if I speak the tongues of men and angels and I have not love, I'm a clanging cymbal and a noisy gong. If I've given my life and I have not love, it has been for naught. You see it? There's this beautiful thing that he's doing. And so I would, I would tell you that what I think that this sermon is about is, is how I learned how to quit worrying and learn to love love. I think God is trying to blow something up in us. He's trying to blow up in us all this duty stuff, all this responsibility. He's trying to blow up the spirit in us that would so subtly take us into directions of works and burden and duty. And he's trying to take us to a place to where it's the most natural, easy, loving thing that there is. And so I'm gonna ask you to do something right now. We always want to have a moment to try and respond to the word that God has given us, right? And we're only gonna take about two minutes here, and I'm just telling you, please don't leave right now. We're not done, we're gonna take communion, and and it's going to be important that you stay. But bottom line is, Pam's going to come up, and she's going to play a little something behind this. And I want you to right now be merry. I want you to take this message, bring it before the Lord, sit at his feet, and let him speak to you about this message.
this idea that it's about love, that what he's trying to teach us is how to love the way he loves, how to be people that are loving in the way that he intends. See it? So literally, I'm only going to take about two minutes on this, not very long. If you're here and you don't know the Lord or you're, this is uncomfortable for you, just, just, just try it, would you? And just say, I just heard something. Are you there? Whatever. But let him talk to you, okay? Sit at his feet here for just a couple minutes, and then we'll wrap up, okay? sense of duty and it just being a sense of love. talk to him about just unburdening from the distractions and agendas. Let him talk to you about how to get free from what's trying to capture you. That you might be captured by what is him and him alone. feel a little more peaceful? Anybody feel any weight taken off your shoulders? Anybody feel more loved despite and who you are? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for so tenderly and beautifully walking us through the same thing that you walked the disciples through. We don't embrace it as just a sermon series. We embrace it as the transformational thing of life that you intend it to be. Step by step, ease by ease. Not a hard push, but a steady and wonderful journey. Thank you, Lord. Reach down in front of you, would you, and take this. There's these cups, two of them, one on top of the other. And take the bottom cup out and just lift it up before the Lord right now and just understand 
And let's just pray together and agree with me, would you, that, Lord, in Jesus' name, we have, uh, we have gotten so busy and gotten so stressed and gotten so distracted that we ended up complaining to you about things like, why, is, why weren't we getting more help? When, in fact, there was something much more important happening right in front of us. And in so doing, God, we've broken our lives. Put your finger in there and break it. God, thank you. Jesus, thank you that you came and on the cross that you healed all that was broken. By your stripes, we are healed. Thank you for taking upon yourself everything that was stolen and I let get stolen from me. So in Jesus' name, take this body of Christ together to be made whole, to be healed completely and utterly. Thank you, Lord. And now, Lord, in the spectacular name of Jesus Christ and who he is and what it is that you're doing, we lift this cup and we say to you, the life that you desire for me to live has already been purchased in full when you were when before you died and you said it is finished and then you breathed your last that was the moment at which everything that needed to be done was done it is finished and so now god as your beloved disciples as your beloved children as your brothers and sisters, Jesus. We just come and say, gently, lovingly, and just as you did with the disciples, make my life line up with the one that you have for me. In Jesus' name. Ushers, thank you for coming forward. Congregation, thank you for being generous for being open thank you for investing in what god is trying to do through this church we need you to do that in richness in fullness in cheerfulness we need you with a cheerful heart to pour into god's kingdom that he might be able to pour out from this place his life so in Jesus' name, God, we do not get to this place by ourselves. We get to it together. We get to it because you have given us, and we have simply poured back from what you have poured in. So in Jesus' holy and precious name, God, receive this offering that your kingdom might go forward in fullness. In Jesus' holy and precious name. <laughs>